Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Jinnah Institute's Ideas Conclave. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, our uh, two keynote speakers, Ambassador Zakir Wa of Afghanistan, and of course the advisor, the distinguished advisor on foreign affairs, uh, Mr. Sattar Aziz, our um, honorary president, vice president, uh, Mr. Ambassador Aziz Ahmed Khan. Uh, many uh, ambassadors, excellencies, friends, members of the media, welcome once again and my sincere apologies for the wait. Uh, we try always to start on time and as you see the advisor was also on time. But anyway, we're all here now and looking forward to uh, a robust and exciting afternoon ahead to discuss what we call the Afghan question. Uh, but more than the question, I think it is a transition that we are all watching very carefully uh, and the idea today uh, ladies and gentlemen friends is to encourage a lively but inclusive discussion where uh, the idea is to build some hope for an inclusive regional and secure future for the countries that we are discussing. There is more than one country involved always in any discussion on South and Central Asia. So we will be broadening the scope of our uh, talk. However, we have two keynote speakers here as I described and I will be inviting the Afghan ambassador to speak first and give his thoughts. Uh, but quickly to spur the discussion along, I just want to throw out a few uh, key ideas. The whole project at that Jinnah Institute envisages uh, is really about uh, taking charge of our future. Now you take charge of your future only after making sense of the present. And making sense of the present uh, and also understanding the past or coming to terms with the past is crucial to going forward and not muddling through strategically, which many countries are doing in terms of their foreign policy. Uh, that includes many great powers as well. And Pakistan, Afghanistan, the entire region has to protect its own interests and look to a stable future. Now, why are we obviously discussing the Afghan transition? What, what uh, are Pakistan's stakes? Pakistan's stakes, as you know, ladies and gentlemen, are very high. Uh, they are high because we have uh, vital stakes in Afghan security, stability, and peace. Uh, these are not and should not devolve into cliches. They should be pinned and pivoted on key policy moves and articulations that Pakistan can and should make. The important difference from the past, ladies and gentlemen, that the Institute has been at pains to advocate and point out uh, in our mapping of change is that we see in the civilian transitions from both the last government to this, uh, there has been a key shift in Pakistan's policy towards Afghanistan, the realization that we must embrace all political and ethnic stakeholders in Afghanistan, number one, that we must not treat Afghanistan as a strategic backyard. It is a sovereign country, and we must uh, play our uh, cards with Afghanistan as a sovereign country. We must assist, but we must not always guide. We must assist Afghan futures. Um, and fourthly, that envisages uh, a plan that Afghanistan decides for itself. Uh, Afghanistan too has seen key transitions to democracy. We have all embraced uh, that change and we see President Ghani as an opportune interlocutor for such change. Uh, he has done all in his power, incidentally, to bring in more stakeholders and to unite Kabul, but I won't really speak to uh, that problem right now, Kabul is uh, facing or experiencing democracy in ways that all democracies do, uh, and that is with differing centers of power. We all have them. Kabul has a little more of them right now, 
the idea, though, is to reach out to all centers of power and to speak to each other and not at each other. That is, I think, very important. And to bring peacemaking or peace building ventures into the ambit of inclusivity and Afghan-led initiatives. Now, that may seem like a good plan. Operationalizing it is going into many uh, details and dots that don't always connect. Uh, people are looking at the uh, Taliban battlefield, um, obviously, successes. Uh, they're controlling more than 15 provinces out of 35 or more. Um, we often ask then what are the incentives for that conversation for them to join the quest for a negotiated settlement. A negotiated settlement is in the best interests of Afghanistan and all the regional partners in, in the area, including Iran and India, seem to agree on that. A negotiated settlement entails a conversation. Pakistan has been doing its utmost for the last four to five years to encourage that conversation, but it cannot lead that conversation. Uh, it must also make it clear that there are limits to Pakistani state power in leading that conversation and in taking it towards whichever conclusion that Afghanistan steers it to. Of course, the question remains that um, who speaks from Afghanistan and who speaks from the Taliban. Recently, you have seen the Taliban leadership cohere around uh, some kind of centrality, uh, which will have its own uh, implications for the reconciliation process. Uh, and uh, my one question would be, and I think that President Ghani encourages us in doing so, uh, is who would be included in that conversation, the roadmap keeps changing, the red lines keep changing. Um, Afghan fragility is also well known in terms of financial stakes, uh, and I think we should use this opportunity to urge all stakeholders to assist uh, an Afghan state cohesion process, which will include more than as much as security, financial stability, uh, and uh, some level of sustainability. They have been making gains uh, for civil society in the past 10 years, which we hope are not reversed. Uh, but the security vacuum from wherever NATO and ISAF has pulled off, pulled out or redeployed to use uh, military language is very clear. And it poses a threat not to just the stability of the Afghan equation, but to the region as well. Pakistan's stakes are very high. We have had a very security-centric conversation and relationship. And it is very important for us to build um, civil and other society goals and uh, outputs amongst each other and not to bridge the trust deficit, which is huge. There is also a cognitive disconnect, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, between the two countries, which surprises Pakistan, the average Pakistani because they say, well, we've been hosting Afghans for so many years and we look forward to um, having them as our friendly neighbors. Uh, that is not always the case when you cross over into Afghanistan. And there are questions we need to ask ourselves and the Afghans in, in an effort uh, with the objective and with an absence of malice in the room and outside to seek and build partnerships. Because as you know, one of our common enemies, even with India, should be terrorism amongst other uh, inequality, um, amongst inequality and uh, other goals that we need to work together in the region. This is increasingly a borderless world. The sooner we recognize it, the better it is for states to resume the monopoly of the use of force on power. It is a very uncertain world out there. It is not just for the region that is needing, that needs trade with each other. Afghanistan and Pakistan both need to lock into the energy securities of Central Asia. We need each other to transit. We need each other for combating terrorism. But Pakistan's been put in a difficult position. We are fighting one of the largest inland wars against terrorism in the world right here alone. It may have come late, but here it is now. It has its deficiencies, 
but here it is now. And one of the questions to ask ourselves is that while we have a large open border, very porous, what do we do when we are fighting a war against a, a Taliban called the TTP at home and we are pressured to reconcile the Afghan Taliban next door? It is a very difficult equation to square. And these are questions that we must consider together before the velocity and weight of challenges overtakes key players in our governments and we hear each other speaking at each other again as opposed to to each other. So without further ado, I'm going to request uh, the ambassador, the Honorable Ambassador of Afghanistan, Mr. Uh, Zakhil Zad, to please join us here at the podium and share his thoughts and help bridge this trust deficit. Thank you. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellency Sir Taj Aziz, my very good friend and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Dr. Sher Rahman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, let me thank you for um, both inviting me and also inviting my good friend Sertaj Azizab at the same time to this very distinguished gathering and giving us the opportunity to um, discuss the vital relationship between our two countries. Um, you um, I was listening, you repeated at least three or four times that we should be talking to each other rather than at each other. And um, I want to congratulate you that by providing this opportunity, you have in fact provided precisely that environment to be talking to each other. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have some notes with me. I certainly would want to make use of them. But before I, I, I start to, to use that, I just caution um, in every such um, uh, occasion um, that I'm not a diplomat. Uh, I'm an ambassador, but I'm not a diplomat. By career, I'm an economist. I was a former finance minister. And I have accepted this responsibility not for the job, but by but for the mission. And the mission is if I could be helpful in whatever way I can to um, change the current state of our relationship, which could be best described as estranged, <coughs> if not totally broken. Therefore, um, I can afford to be a bit undiplomatic and frank. Um, but what I cannot afford in the presence of media, on a light note, is to be misquoted. So <laughs> I, I advise caution. Um, um, if there is, if I say a certain thing, and, and it sounds interesting, very, very interesting, interesting is fine. If, if it sounds too interesting, please check back with me if I've said it. Um, the topic that was given to me to be discussing is, um, again, peace. And then, of course, uh, from peace, I would, I would also shed light on the state of the relationship and, and my thoughts and as well as um, the efforts that I intend to um, give um, to be helpful. Peace in Afghanistan and also peace in Pakistan, because without peace in Afghanistan, it has been proven time and again that Pakistan cannot have peace. We certainly, being the center of conflict, um, receive the heavier burden of the conflict, but Pakistan has not remained unaffected. If the last incident 
the tragic incident of Lahore is of any reminder, any example, and similar incidents in, in Peshawar, the Pacha Khan University, the Shafkadar incident, the army school, and many more are examples of the consequences that the situation of Afghanistan has had for Pakistan. But the price that Pakistan pays is certainly a lot more. It's not just the tens or twenties or fifty or sixty or seventy or hundred or two hundred or two thousand or a hundred thousand casualties, but it's the image. It is then, of course, the economic impact that insecure image of Pakistan as a result of the, the situation in Afghanistan um, has affected the, the Pakistan economy. I'm an economist, and therefore I, I love to talk about numbers um, and, and give those a highlight. Um, again, both, both based on my my readings of, of, of Pakistani writers, other writers, and my own sort of guesstimates, if estimate is too difficult, I would say Pakistan probably, potentially, loses anywhere between 60 to 70 to 80 billion dollars, and potentially, and in the national uh, sort of the gross, gross domestic product of the country. If it were not for Afghanistan, if it, there was peace in Afghanistan, and if the image, the resulted image of Pakistan was not as it is today, then Pakistan would be receiving or generating probably 60, 70, 80 billion dollars more a year. And then we need to put that into a perspective as to what it would mean to Pakistan that per person, per capita, on a yearly basis, probably mean anywhere between 400 to 500 dollars. So imagine how much good that could have brought to Pakistan. I'm not even talking about Afghanistan, because in Afghanistan, we are paying certainly a lot more. Therefore, at least in Pakistan, but also in the broader region, Peace in Afghanistan should not be just considered as peace in that country. And therefore, that when we say our role is to help Afghans with peace, to, to express peace in terms of sympathy, in terms of favor, in terms of support, would be to minimize the impact and the importance in the value of peace for us. Pakistan supporting peace in Afghanistan would be in fact helping itself first and foremost, but also Afghanistan. The region helping Afghanistan with peace and stability will be helping itself um, with stability and peace in the region. Coming back to, to Pakistan and Afghanistan, because that's the focus of today's discussion, Pakistan considers itself as the gateway to Central Asia. And we consider ourselves as a land bridge between Central Asia and South Asia. Pakistan cannot be a gateway to Central Asia without peace in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan cannot be a land bridge between South Asia and South Asia without the best of relationship that we do need and also peace in Pakistan. If peace is so vital in Afghanistan, for Afghanistan and for Pakistan, and for the region, why hasn't it 
been achieved? Why can't we make progress or haven't we made progress on peace? And here is, I need to be very frank and undiplomatic, I think. The main hurdle to peace, the biggest obstacle to peace is Afghan-Pakistan relationship. It's the environment of mistrust. It's the environment that we suspect each other. It's the environment of practical disengagement. Of course, we have visits and, and um, pleasantries, lots of them, to say about each other on occasions but to be practically, meaningfully involved in first and foremost peace between us and then of course helping each other with peace and stability. I personally have seen not a significant amount of it. So the, the, the first step for peace would be to create an environment of trust between, between us. To believe, to believe that in Afghanistan, that Pakistan wants peace in Afghanistan, that peace in Afghanistan is in the national interest of Pakistan, that it's viewed as such that peace in Afghanistan is pursued not as a matter of courtesy, but as a matter of policy. And also believe in Pakistan that Afghans want stability and peace and friendship and brotherhood with Pakistan. That it is, it is absolutely categorically not in a mindset of animosity towards Pakistan for whatever reason. Now, the question then is, if trust is the main or the lack of trust is the main issue. But before I get to that, Um, I need to ask myself um, this question. Whether I believe that Pakistan believes that peace is in the national interest of Pakistan. If I didn't believe that, then I would not be standing here before you and I will not be having this job. It's obvious, but I also do believe that Pakistan believes that peace and stability in Afghanistan is in its national interest. I do believe that Pakistan believes that is a special brotherly relationship with Afghanistan is its national interest. But, like I said, this first hurdle, that's my belief, but a broader belief in my country and a broader belief within this country how that could be overcome. First, on our end, we are a country at war. We are a country that's bleeding. We are a country that on a daily basis, we lose about 250 people, mostly innocent civilians. We 
we are a country that's facing um, a group of Afghans, of course, um, that are threatening the state, the structures, and the peace of, of our country. And in Afghanistan, again, being undiplomatic and frank, there is this belief or um, that Pakistan could help could help Afghanistan for their violence and their destruction and their killing to first get reduced and certainly um, be with the support of Pakistan sort of be resolved and eliminated. There is this belief that there is a support for elements that destabilizes Afghanistan, frankly put, the Taliban. That there are bases or war bases who got support on Pakistani territory with knowledge of Pakistani institutions or perhaps support as well. And from Pakistani territory, all those I said happen and are threatened. Similar misgivings also exist here. And I'm not going to details. Of course, there will be question and answer period. I'll elaborate. But India certainly is a factor in, in the misgivings that Pakistan has vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. So I'll briefly um, sort of outline as to how we can overcome the environment of mistrust, which then will create an environment in which it will be tough for elements of instability, elements that threaten our security, and elements that threaten your security. The first thing I would suggest we could do is to use our people-to-people -people relationship in the multiplicity of the dimensions of our relationship to leverage them for peace and to leverage them for state-to-state -state relationship. People-to-people -people relationship is probably the most unique in the world. The common ancestry, the common culture, the common language, the common faith, the common history, geography, economy, relationships, personal relationships, and a common destiny are things that tie us together. So much that Pakistan and Afghanistan have in common, you cannot find any two countries anywhere in the world that they do. And yet we have not utilized them for, for a state-to-state -state relationship. Second, I mentioned our regional roles and ambitions, a gateway to Central Asia, a landmark between South Asia and Central Asia, are absolutely our common goals. And if more focus was given to those objectives, and if investments, particularly by our international partners, were made into those connectivities, we would have been in a different state. Third. We definitely need a genuine, frank, direct, and broader interaction between Afghanistan and Pakistan. I've had this discussion with uh, um, my brother, Sir Taj Aziz, even on the quadrilateral meeting that we would want to have our international partners 
not to pressure Afghanistan or Pakistan to talk, to pressure us to agree, to pressure us to decide, because we need to sit down and talk. They don't need to make us to talk. We need, first and foremost, we need to sit down and talk. We need to agree. We need to decide. And let's use the Americans and the Chinese and every other international to put something other on the table, rather than pressure, rather than bringing a solution. Two countries with these so many dimensions of relationships could not be easily understood by others. So only as understand each other, because it's not a one-dimensional, two-dimensional relationship, many dimensional relationship. Again, outsiders, they come, they will propose things to us that will make matters worse, not better. So we need to talk to each other. And certainly, of course, in the, if, if quadrilateral is any example, we've done precisely that and we've done well. Third, and of course, when it comes to the interaction, I do, I do not mean only interaction between the state to state, government officials to government officials. We need to encourage broader interaction between media to media, between academics to academics, between youth to youth, women to women, and it is those type of sort of broader interactions that will diminish the level of misperceptions which is so high and is the main source of mistrust significantly and therefore contribute to a better relationship. Fourth, agreeing to pursue National interests, our own national interests, that are not at the detriment of the other country. That our national interests, at a minimum, are not at a cost of the other country. Fully respecting each other's sovereignty. That's the key, particularly on our issue. Afghans, every nation, but particularly Afghans, are extremely guarded of their sovereignty. And as a sovereign nation, respecting each country, each other country's decision to foster relationship with whatever other nation it so desires. Fourth, fifth, that our policy for each other is independent and irrespective of our relationship with any other third country. And I count, I lost count, sixth or seventh, that we resolve in the demonstrate not to our, allow our respective territories and spaces to be used against the peace and stability of each other. But at the same time, of course, death, we are not against legitimate stakes in our countries for each other. Last, we ask the international community to, instead of investing or spending so much on a fight against terrorism, which in fact has increased it, a small portion of that on connectivity between two countries, on creating interdependency between two countries. If we take only 1%, 1 percent, 1 percent, of what has been spent in fight against terrorism in Afghanistan and in this region, that would be about 10 to 15 to 20 billion dollars. If you put 10 to 15 billion dollars into connectivity, we will absolutely be in a different state of relationship. We will be focused on railways, on roads, on energy, you name it. And 
we would be so better off. And lastly, of course, my message is for the media. The media is not helping. The media in Pakistan is responsible, and the media in Afghanistan is responsible for the current state of mistrust. Um, it's not people focused. It's not people's aspirations focused. It um, sensationalizes issues that divide us. Smaller issues are made bigger. Um, it romanticizes violence. Unfortunately, in our case, the Taliban, um, it should focus more on the suffering of the people, the people in Afghanistan and also in Pakistan. As a result of these heinous crimes and, 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 and attacks and fighting, on a daily basis, your brothers, your sisters, your children die mercilessly. And it, it destroys. It destroys families, it destroys the country, and has also affected our relationship. Our relationship was so, so vital. So my appeal to the media is to be more helpful, to be more positive, to be more, more sort of, instead of, 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 of um, rumors focused, facts based, facts focused, um, with the intention, because they also have a responsibility that brings the two countries closer together, and that bringing them together will certainly contribute immensely to the trust that is unfortunately not there and therefore will create an environment for peace, stability, and security, and a better life for all our people. With that, thank you very much. And of course, I'll be at your pleasure. Thank you for that uh, distinguished ambassador, Zakhil Wal. That was comprehensive and uh, gave us a lot of uh, food for uh, thinking and perhaps action at some point. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm going to invite uh, our uh, advisor on foreign affairs, the distinguished and honorable Sartaj Aziz Sahab, who will, I hope, lay out some uh, thoughts on the future of the quadrilateral process, its limits, uh, limits of state power, and perhaps the role of Pakistan in stabilizing not just uh, Afghanistan, but in, in the region as well, our larger goals. Just quickly, I want to add, nobody has brought up the role of women in peace building and national security. This is not a hobby horse, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it is very important to remember and acknowledge that uh, President Ghani has done all that he can in his power to bring in four federal cabinet ministers who are women. That is doing better than Pakistan today. And he is doing a great deal to mainstream at least women's voices, uh, if not in national security, then in the Afghan messaging process and the democratic experience. Now today, um, when we talk of roadmaps and bridge building, one of the committees in that, that sort of define uh, roadmaps and bridge building from Afghanistan, I believe hosts now a woman. I hope it is more than token, and I hope participation of uh, voters, 40% of Afghanistan's voters have been women in the last election. I'm sure that will increase as it has in Pakistan. And I would like very much for uh, the Honorable Advisor to speak to us about all such issues. I know that you have your time is very precious, so please, can I welcome you here and a big hand for him. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ambassador Zakhilwal, Madam Shari Rahman, Rahman, distinguished excellencies, gentlemen and guests. May I begin by thanking Jinnah Institute for inviting me to this panel discussion regarding peace and stability in Afghanistan, which is a subject of crucial importance for Pakistan. And I'm personally grateful to Madam Shari Rahman for arranging this thought-provoking session. You have just heard a very frank and incisive statement from Umar Zal Khilwal, the ambassador of Afghanistan, who has deep insight into the affairs of Afghanistan. And as he said, he is here on a mission 
to improve uh, relations between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And this is a mission that we all wish every success, and I personally am in close touch with him to achieve that objective. The title of today's panel discussion, From Winter to Spring, Revisiting the Afghan Question, is important, interesting, and topical. In my view, it doesn't just signify the journey from winter to spring, but also our efforts to move from unending violence to lasting peace, and from prolonged conflict and instability to an era of progress and development for Afghanistan and its region. In this context, I would like to divide my remarks in three parts, historical analysis, Afghan peace and reconciliation process, and Pakistan perspective on peace and stability in Afghanistan. Historic analysis, as most of you know, this conflict in the past four decades has undergone three distinct phases. The first was from mid-70s to end-80s, saw Afghanistan becoming the theater of superpower rivalry, leading to a decade-long Soviet occupation from 1980 right till 91. In the valiant jihad against Soviet occupation, Pakistan firmly stood with Afghan people hosting millions of refugees, an overwhelming number of whom have been living in Pakistan now for over three decades. The second state from 1990 to 2001, following the Soviet withdrawal, is unfortunately characterized by internal discord, rivalry, and civil war, exhibiting failure to transform the common jihadi struggle into political power-sharing arrangement, and it culminated in Taliban rule from something like 96 to 2001. The third phase marked by the presence of US-led forces in Afghanistan since 2001 saw many key achievements, including a new Afghan constitution, a revival of democratic institutions, and major expansion in education and health services. At the same time, unfortunately, conflict and violence did not end during this period, but continued throughout uh, and still continues. The year 2014, as you are aware, saw three important transition. The security transition, when the NATO ISAF forces were drawn down or reduced from about 130,000 to uh, around 10,000 troops. The political transition, when after the April to June 2014 election, a government of national unity was formed in September 2014 an economic transition in which following the drastic reduction in the financial flows associated with the ESI forces, the rate of economic growth slowed down and the rate of unemployment grew rapidly. In this historical perspective, the issue of Afghan peace and reconciliation, my second topic, assume great importance and it is particularly encouraging that finally a consensus has emerged on the importance of politically negotiated settlement in Afghanistan through an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led process as the best way forward toward lasting peace in Afghanistan. And Pakistan, with the support from US, China, facilitated the first round of direct talks at Mari on 7 July, but the second round scheduled for 31st July could not be held when the news of Mullah Omar's death was leaked two days earlier. Finally, on 9 December, on the outside lines of the fifth Heart of Asia Ministerial Conference in Islamabad, Pakistan, Afghanistan, US, and China established the quadrilateral coordination group to facilitate the resumption of direct talks between the Afghan government and the Taliban. Under the principle of shared commitment for lasting peace, the QCG countries have been engaged in joint efforts for convening direct peace talks. They agreed on terms of reference for the group and a detailed roadmap, and they have had three meetings, and the fourth one is likely this month, later this month. Pakistan has also offered to host the first round of these resumed talks. If I move on now to Pakistan's perspective on peace and reconciliation, I like to outline briefly the following main elements. First, Pakistan believes lasting peace in Afghanistan is important for regional peace and stability, 
as Ambassador Zakhiwal emphasized, this goal can be achieved through direct peace talks between an Afghan-owned and Afghan-led peace process. While other countries can play a role in facilitating the process, the sustainability and outcome of the peace process essentially hinges upon Afghan ownership and leadership. Pakistan has continued to play a facilitating role in the Afghan reconciliation effort. It was the result of our efforts that the uh, last year, first ever direct talks between the Afghan government and Taliban were held in Mari. Within the QCG, Pakistan has been making serious efforts to facilitate direct peace talks between Taliban and government and Afghanistan. We believe other three QCG countries are also making similar efforts under the principle of shared responsibility. While Pakistan will continue to play a positive role in the process, it is important to recognize that we cannot dictate terms to either the Afghan government or the Afghan Taliban. As Ambassador Zakhiwal just said, it is they who have to come to terms and reach a basis on which negotiation can be successful. The experience of peace process elsewhere in the world shows clearly that these involve complex and time-consuming negotiations on intricate issues involving divergent perspectives. Therefore, it is not prudent to attach arbitrary timelines or deadlines or even conditionalities to the process, the focus should be on meaningful and sustainable outcomes. In the past 15 years, exclusive military approach has not worked in Afghanistan. It is therefore important that the focus of the reconciliation effort should be on an inclusive process. As we move forward, the QCG will have to collectively decide how to deal with those who refuse to join the peace process. Pakistan can certainly feel the pain of Afghans caused by the continued senseless violence because Pakistan itself has been a victim of brutal terrorism. As it was just reminded, army public school carnage, the Basha Khan University attack, or the gruesome Lahore tragedy. Pakistan is therefore committed that one of the key goals of the Afghan reconciliation process should be reduction and ultimate cessation of violence in that country. An important challenge will be to keep the process on track and prevent attempts by detractors and spoilers to derail the process as we have seen in the past. We are concerned, of course, at the continued negative prop propaganda in Afghanistan about Pakistan, despite our concerted efforts for peace and stability in, in Afghanistan. And as Ambassador Zakhipal pointed out, the key issue is the trust, restoring trust between the two countries. And to do so, we have to keep in mind the close historical and cultural bonds existing in our country, as well as the continued support extended by Pakistan and the people of Pakistan to Afghanistan for past several decades. Our government uh, policy on relation with Afghanistan is rooted in respect for its sovereignty, territorial integrity, and recognition of the Afghan national unity government as the legitimate government of Afghanistan. It is important that our two countries continue to work towards broadening, widening, and deepening the engagements in a mutually beneficial manner. It is encouraging that the two sides are now closely working on cooperation in security and counterterrorism. We believe that there is a pressing need to implement an effective framework for border management to check cross-border movements of terrorists and other criminal elements that frequent this area for smuggling and other purposes. And we look forward to strengthening this cooperation with Afghanistan as early as possible. Pakistan and Afghanistan should also work out an effective strategy for the dignified repatriation of Afghan refugees by creating pull factors in Afghanistan for their settlement and livelihood. The international community, of course, should provide financial support to both countries to meet this challenge. To conclude, I would like to add that it's not merely our hope, but our sincere and genuine desire to see our Afghan brother live in peace and stability, and we all must work together to achieve this noble objective as early and as effectively as possible. With these words, I thank the Jinnah Institute again. Thank you, and uh, 
Sartad Saab for those words. Uh, and now I'd like to invite uh, Ambassador Aziz Khan, who has been ambassador in both Kabul and New Delhi, and is our very active vice president to uh, join us as discussant. He's keen to do it from the floor. That means he's hiding stuff from you guys. So please, Let's maybe you can throw the first question out. Thank you. After the, these thought-provoking addresses and very honest and frank assessment of the situation, I'm sure that the audience are all itching to ask questions and dis uh, take the discussion further. And to start that discussion, I would just make a couple of observations and not take too much time. That is why I don't wish to walk down to the podium, because then I'll take a lot more time if I went there. Uh, the key factor that has come out in the, to, this afternoon uh, is the mistrust. There is mist, and as I see it, there are two mistrusts prevailing here. One is the intra-Afghan mistrust, and one is the Pakistan Afghan mistrust. The intra-Afghan mis mistrust will, be, will have to be sorted out uh, among the Afghans themselves. Nobody really, some pe people can help, but essentially Afghans know each other very well. They know exactly what are the causes of this mistrust, and they can, having been associated with Afghanistan for a reasonably long time, I can say that they have the wisdom, the tradition, and the sagacity to, to, to overcome these factors. The mistrust is based in the recent history, or, and by recent, not that recent, almost the three decades of the situation in Afghanistan, which has created groups, factions within Afghanistan, where then that mistrust, mistrust has developed. One saw that during the formation of the Mujahideen government also. One saw that when the Taliban were ruling and we were trying to create a situation where the two war warring sides within Afghanistan could come to, together to each other. And I was involved with that. And my own impression was that everybody was not trusting the others. And that is something that Afghanistan has to do and pay attention to. The mistrust between Pakistan and Afghanistan, again, has historical factors. It has historical factors practically right from the time Pakistan was created. But those factors were being overcome and are being, being worked at. <clears throat> and those can be, can be overcome, one, by having a fr frank discussion with each other. That discussion, one is encouraged to see that has started. Sincere attempts are being made both by both sides to address that mistrust and address those issues. And I'm sure if we remain engaged in that manner, we will be able to overcome the, that, uh, the, that mis mistrust. Another factor which is leading to uh, misunderstandings is the border situation. And whenever uh, when, uh, anybody talks about border controls, better border control, it somehow uh, rubs a large number of people the wrong way, which really is not understanding the question very well. The point is that the Pakistan and Afghanistan, by the nature of relationship and the nature of their history, have to have a very open border. There's no question about that. Nobody wants to close the border or control the border, but the border should be managed in a matter, ma manner that it is well documented. The border needs to be a well-documented border and not a restricted border. And that is where, where things are difficult, where we should at least know who is crossing, what goods are crossing, what materials are crossing, what people are crossing. That can be, easy, that can be done fairly easily if the two sides decide to have adequate check posts, and I think Pakistan has made that offer several times. We have not really addressed that issue very well. It should not be difficult to manage that border. The, even the tribals who are li li living across know who has crossed and when they have crossed. So in order to overcome, uh, overcome these uh, difficulties, there is, I think there is, there is need, to, need to address that. We, that mention was made, and I think we should discuss that as well, is about uh, the gateway to Central Asia and the bridge to Central Asia. Yes, the bridge cannot function if the gateway is malfunctioning. And gateway, and, and gateway cannot function if the bridge is creaky and is not functioning properly. So we need to, the two countries, the gateway and the bridge, need to sit together and see how to make that more efficient and better because economically, 
it would be beneficial to both the countries, apart from being beneficial to both the region. I think I'll conclude here, and I'm sure uh, the audience wish to ask many questions. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz Saab. Um, we can take a few questions or, um, and brief, and please introduce yourselves uh, and address yourself to a specific panelist, uh, if I may. Um, yeah, I, so I see one hand right away up there. While the mic's journey goes there, please introduce yourself. Is there no mic for them, for the questioners? Where is the mic for the questioners? Where is the mic for the people on the floor? Well, I also have a question which I sort of vaguely brought up during the, the discussion, which is, and it's, to, it's addressed to both our uh, keynote speakers, that again, our goals for the quadrilateral and reconciliation seem to have shifted to a lower bar of cessation of violence right now. Uh, what are the prospects of that? And as Aziz Khan just said, uh, why is the cycle of discussion on border controls going along? From my understanding of Pakistani governments, both are ready and willing to cooperate in all sorts of biometric and other arrangements. I think that is essential to the process. So if I may add that to the mix. G, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Sheri Rahman. My first question is, this is Mateen Heather representing Dawn News, Defense and Foreign Affairs Correspondent. First question is to Excellency Afghan Ambassador. Despite uh, Pakistan's repeated request, why there is no action against uh, militants and those terrorists who come from Afghan territory and carry out attacks in Pakistan tribal areas, particularly on Pakistani security forces? So question to Advisor on Foreign Affairs, Sartaj Aziz uh, Probably two days back, an Afghan Secret Service agent was nabbed from Balochistan. So your comments, please. And also, what steps the uh, government of Pakistan is taking to uh, prevent such things from uh, to uh, definitely to, to take action against the network of hostile intelligence agencies towards Pakistan? Pakistan territory has been taken for granted. Afghan secret service agents are being arrested. We have seen an Indian one. And, uh, and then there might be a number of others. So your comments on uh, this situation in Pakistan. Thank you so much. Would uh, there's been a slew of, would you like to address these uh, both gentlemen right now? Thank you. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. sure. Um, first of all, um, do you know that um, the culprits of the those, those responsible for the army school attacks in Peshawar. Um, and their arrests and would not have happened without our support. Um, it's something that, again, I, do, I see very little of it in the, in the media. Um, um, therefore, that, that uh, serious um, um, attack uh, that really shook Pakistan, not just the KPK, but the whole of Pakistan. Afghanistan was extremely, extremely instrumental in, in sort of in supporting and helping Afghanistan on its own territory to go and, and get those responsible. But at the same time, we are a country at war. We are a country that is fighting the Taliban all over Afghanistan, and a consequence of your army's operation in the border area, in North Waziristan and South Waziristan and others, has not been a total elimination of those individuals or arrest of those individuals. A lot of those have been pushed. Uh, not intentionally, certainly we must be clear about this, but, but they have taken refuge on the other side. 
um, it is for that purpose you can expect us to go after such elements when we are a country in peace and in control of our territory. Um, and that's why it's important, because for, from instability in Afghanistan would certainly not be just hurting us because elements that threaten us will be taking refuge there and attacking us, but elements that are attacking you will also be um, um, uh, um, sort of uh, taking refuge. On the recent attack in Lahore, just for your information, we had discussion, myself here had discussion, and I communicated that back to Kabul, in fact, I made a trip to Kabul, and the first thing that our president ordered that we should give every support based on whatever information the Pakistani intelligence and army provides to us to go and case the culprits on our side to go after them and, and, and arrest them and hand them um, to the Pakistan. So that's resolving that sort of intention to help you um, with arresting those who commit such incidents and prevent them in the future, definitely that. And of course, we have our, like I said, our self-interest in that, because these elements that threaten you are dangerous people. If they are on our soil, they also threaten us. So it is in our interest not to have them. I think Ambassador Aziz Khan is right in drawing attention to the inter-Afghan and intra-Afghan and uh, India-Pakistan um, lack of trust because the two are to some extent interrelated because that is spillover into this also. But I'm glad to say in the last few months, uh, a greater consensus has emerged on the importance of reconciliation and political solution. In July, for example, when the Murray talks were taking place, uh, that consensus was not complete and that obviously affected the efficacy of the talks. But now I find there is a much greater consensus, President Shrav Ghani and uh, uh, Chief Executive Abdullah Abdullah have both uh, reaffirmed their commitment and I think so now this certainly will send the right signals uh, for the success of the talk. So I think as uh, the reduction in the intra-Afghanistan intra intra mistrust also is necessary uh, prerequisite for the success of these talks. Uh, secondly, I think uh, the fact that we are putting emphasis on reduction in hostility doesn't mean that the agenda is confined to it, but that is a conducive, creating a conducive environment for more serious and sustainable outcomes. Because on the one hand, if you are talking and then you are stepping up uh, violence in Afghanistan, it obviously creates a, a negative atmosphere. So that is why we are, it, we are not using it as a precondition, but we hope that as talks begin, uh, some understanding can be reached on uh, uh, some reduction in hostility. In the uh, 31st July meeting also, there was a plan to say at least some cities should be declared, you know, violence-free or something like that. Some uh, gesture is required to achieve that. So, But the ultimate purpose, of course, is that when talks begin, then it will not be just cessation of hostilities, but durable peace. And that requires, you know, and that is something which Afghanistan and the Taliban have to work out among themselves. Now, on the other uh, uh, question, I, we agree with the remarks made about board, importance of border management, because without that, we can't stop uh, the movement of people who are undesirable from both sides. So I think that uh, we are working on SOPs on border management, which I hope can be put into operation as early as possible. About the mm, uh, uh, network and the arrest of the agent, I think uh, we should uh, acknowledge that this is not something that is happening now, it has been happening, but our agencies deserve credit for uh, now moving much more actively and uh, trying to unearth. This is still work in progress uh, as to the investigation that is going on because it's not one or two isolated incidents, it's a network which is destabilizing different parts. And so once uh, the investigations move forward, you will hear more about uh, what is being done and how, far, how effective this entire operation has been. Thank you. Um, there's a hand up there.
Third row, please. First. Third row. Please introduce yourself. Yes. My name is Imran Iqbal, and I'm a PhD fellow at University of Leeds in England, and I'm also research associate with the SBI. Uh, thank you very much. You were very candid and thoughtful, Mr. Ambassador, and my questions are for you. Uh, number one, can your government survive if Americans wash their hands off completely from Afghanistan? Number two, if Americans, if, if Americans abandon you, as they are well known for abandoning their friends. Uh, number two, related questions. Uh, if Americans abandon the Northern Alliance and opt for the Taliban in order to raise them as a counterweight against Daesh-like phenomena, what will be the future of Northern Alliance in Afghanistan? And honestly, uh, we still wonder what were Americans' objectives when they invaded Afghanistan, especially after we started believing in the conspiracy theories. Snowden made us believe that. Uh, do you really believe that Americans are interested in ensuring stability in Afghanistan? Because unstable Afghanistan is prob probably in favor of American geopolitical interests because unstable Afghanistan means unstable Central Asia, unstable Xinjiang, unstable Pakistan. So, thank you very much. Should we take a couple of questions and then give those to you? It's Khushbakht Abbas from Sama Devi. And my question is to Your Excellency, Advisor to Prime Minister, Mr. Sattar Javis. Okay. I would like to ask about the Quadrilateral Coordination Group. They have their next meeting. Um, Sir has told us that it's going to be in this month. This meeting would be done after the direct dialogues between Afghan government and the uh, Taliban. So have those dialogues been scheduled or not? I would like to know about this. She's asking if the next quadrilateral is already scheduled or not. It's from Sama TV. Right at the back there in the middle. Yeah. Some student we should give an opportunity to. My question is about uh, economic diplomacy between the hostile countries, for example, like uh, China and America. Last year, their economic uh, trade was $550 billion. Same is the case with China and India. And last year, their economic trade was $80 billion. I mean to say that can't we remove suspicion between India and Afghanistan through uh, trade diplomacy? Thank you so much. Sartaj Javi Sab, would you like to comment on the early uh, statements by Pakistan that uh, we will influence Afghan Taliban to come to the ta dialogue table? But still, there is nothing such happening, and today the Foreign Office also told, uh, the, and you in your uh, uh, own statement mentioned that we can't dictate Afghan Taliban. Uh, and from Afghan ambassador, I would like the, to ask the question about uh, the, uh, the mess between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Sir, why are you not trusting Pakistan and its sincerity? Thank you. Imran Iqbal said, Northern Lines does not exist. <laughs> it was a thing of the past. And that's where you need to update your information or misinformation. Northern Lights existed only during the 90s when there were the Taliban on the one side and the Northern Lights on the other side in 2001. They have gone all their different ways. Some part of the government, some are in opposition. Again, two elections have happened since then, three elections in fact. In each election, those who were back in the Northern Lights went all different ways. So, so still to say that there is Northern Alliance and then there is a, on the other side is the Taliban is to be still living in the past. I want you to update yourself and update your information. On the American issues, again, I'm, you can throw in any conspiracy and could create a logical sort of um, explanations for it. 
But the reality is that the Americans came to Afghanistan because of the terrible incident of 9-11. Well, you don't believe it. That's your belief. But that is, that is what happened. Um, and since then, since then, they've spent about a trillion dollars. And on security. And since then, of course, there have been, um, even then, um, threats to American interest originating from our part of the, the world um, that, that certainly keeps him concerned. And that threat originates because of instability in this region and instability in Afghanistan. So it's not very logical. Because of those fears of the Americans and of the Western countries, that on the one hand, they would feel threatened by insecurity in this region, and on the other side, they would be feeding it. You certainly don't believe it, but that is what I believe in. That's what I was stuck to. Um, my brother there asked about why Afghanistan not trusting Pakistan again. I'm not going to go to the historic or the current reasons. There are two. There are, there are issues that we have, and then there are misperceptions that we have. I sometimes say that if we divide between the contribution of, of, of misperceptions and issues, misperception probably is contributing more than half. And by, in the first step, removing the misperception, we have actually resolved 50% of the issues because they're not even there. And that's what my hope is by sort of this frank discussion and interaction and facts-based dialogue rather than perceptions or misperception, we will be able to first remove the misperceptions in the related mistrust generated from this misperception. This will give us an, an opportunity or the needed trust to then tackle the remaining or the real issues that are between us. The real issues are historic, but as well as current. I think on the first question, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the quadrilateral coordination go fourth meeting has not, fifth meeting has not yet been scheduled, but it's under discussion, likely to be held sometime later this month, but it has not yet been scheduled. Economic diplomacy, of course, as far as Pakistan and Afghanistan is concerned, is our high priority. Our trade is expanding. We are improving our facilities at Torkham and Chaman to facilitate Afghan transit trade. A number of, when Mr. Zakhriwal was finance minister, he had long meetings with our uh, foreign min uh, finance minister and 40, 45 steps were approved to facilitate uh, both trade and other people-to-people -people contact. So this is our priority and I hope it will yield the desired results. Uh, on the last question, uh, I will only add that in my, uh, no, whether, ta have you uh, s been successful in bringing Taliban to the table? As I mentioned in our speech, Pakistan, uh, China, and Afghanistan, and U.S., they all have different contexts with different groups, and that was the whole purpose of the quadrilateral group, that each side will try to contact, be in contact with their respective interlocutors and try to persuade them to come. And uh, that is what the quadrilateral group itself is supposed to do, who has contacted whom and what is likely to be happen. So let's hope that uh, as uh, the process goes on, uh, there will be some uh, breakthrough and at least uh, we have, one doesn't expect a big outcome from the first meeting, but at least if the process starts, we'll be quite satisfied. And may I add to Mr. Khival's uh, last comment that in my view, misperceptions are perhaps 60, 70% and the issue 20 rather than 50, 50. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Aziz Saab, do you have any closing remarks to make? Uh, well, I think I hope this uh, afternoon bridged some of the disconnect and the misperception that was talked about. We have a long way to go. We do know that the spring will be offensive. Let us not be offensive to each other. Let us move towards tea and thank you all for your patience and time. Thank you so much, Sir Tat Thank you, Ambassador.